pound the gavel and open up the meeting. Um, and I think that we probably should take a roll. Um, Eileen, can you take the roll, please? Certainly. Um, Council Member Alvarez? Present. Council Member Sawyer? Here. Um, and let the record reflect that uh, Council Member Fleming has not yet joined. Okay, thank you. And I'm sure that she will once she um, is, is available. Um, and if not, we will continue with the, with, with the agenda. Um, and I have a number of notes. She just texted that she's almost on. So we'll okay. uh, admit her shortly. Okay, should I, let's, let's give her a minute. And there we go. Good morning, Victoria. Good morning, Don, Eddie, Raisa. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, so I, there are a couple of housekeeping issues we had to go through. There's some changes to the agenda. Um, and I've made a number of notes uh, to refer to because of the um, because of the some of the changes that have, have popped up. Um, the, the study session for the council for, for this, for the parklet, this is the, our first item on the agenda. Um, they'll, we will, we're pushing this item for discussion um, for the June 8th subcommittee meeting instead, because um, instead of today, because we, were, we have delayed the, the council date for this conversation has been delayed to June 22nd. So it makes more sense for us to do it a little closer to when the council is going to um, see the item. Um, so we would be continuing the, um, the first item on the agenda until June 8th. And if anyone has questions about that item, uh, please feel free to call the city. Uh, and this would be, uh, is this Raisa, is this the, your, um, number? It's the number for the Economic Development Division. So any questions we have, we can forward it to uh, whoever would be most appropriate to respond. To. Excellent. That sounds great. And that number is 543-3080. Again, 543-3080. So we'll be moving that to our June 8th meeting. Um, and I don't, you know, I given that it's on the agenda, Jeff, should I be asking for public comment? You could. Okay. So, is there um, if if there is anyone who'd like to to not wait until the eighth to offer public comment, um, they can offer that now. Uh, if we if we have anyone waiting, do we have any hands up? We do not have any hands raised at this time. Okay. Excellent. Then we'll just wait until it until we are able to deal with it on on June eighth. Um, the next item on the agenda has to do with um, deferred rent on city properties. And Jill, um, could you uh, address this issue? Um, actually, we do have to pull that one. Jill gave me a call just prior to this meeting saying that there is a, a remaining legal issue that she needs to uh, review, and she hadn't received um, information on that yet, not from our city attorney, to uh, just want to be clear. Um, so uh, she asked that we postpone that as well. And I think she's going to just take that directly to council. So that one is off the agenda as well. Okay, good enough. Thanks, Raisa. Um, and uh, yes. additionally, we, we just uh, the general public comment for anything that's tied to the economic subcommittee, but uh, not on the agenda. We need to request public comment for that as well. Oh, Thank you. Just, just, just for uh, items not on the agenda. Correct. Okay. Um, so, do we have any of those items, um, items not on the agenda that the that the community would like to speak to? Uh, we have no raised hands at this time. Okay. Well, then that being said, we will move on to three point three. Moving, moving right along. 
um, the SB 93 hospitality right of recall update and discussion of local ordinance. Um, Jeff, do you want to um, kind of bring us up to speed? Because um, we, want, we wanted to um, reconsider our recommendation in, in, in advance of this item to, um, for the, to the full council. Um, the state bill, we, this was before the state bill actually passed. And because um, it did pass uh, and is substantially the same as what labor had proposed, um, we need to, you know, let's have the conversation again. Um, uh, indeed, we, we mentioned that we would have a conversation about it, but also knowing that, that, that the council agenda is really super full and even, even pressing items are being shuffled around a lot. It's, it's really, um, our, our open government task force has made some recommendations that have created some scheduling issues. Um, so pushing certain, issues, certain items out to, to further dates. Um, so Jeff, if, if you might be able to give us um, an overview if possible about how the state law um, might be different than our local ordinance as sure. proposed? Sure, so um, just to kind of refresh our recollections, <clears throat> the right of recall um, and both the, the state and, and a local ordinance do the same thing. They essentially uh, are intended to provide hotel workers uh, uh, who are laid off due to COVID related reasons uh, for rehire to make them eligible, give them the opportunity for rehire when positions become available. Uh, and as uh, uh, Council Member Sawyer pointed out, uh, we, we, with this group last met on April 13th, and then three days later, the state law passed. No. So, um, so there, the, the similarities between the state law and a local ordinance that has um, been uh, drafted and recommended by uh, local labor groups uh, have the same definition of hotel, which is, uh, any hotel within the city's jurisdiction that has 50 or more rooms. It also has the same definition of a laid off employee. And to be a laid off employee, you have to have been employed for at least six months uh, up until uh, January 31st, I think, or January 1st, 2020. And then you were uh, let go for a COVID related reason. Um, both the state law and the, the, the draft of the local ordinance um, would would both apply to new owners. So if the hotel transferred ownership, uh, they, the new owner would, would, would be obligated under both the state law and any local ordinance uh, to, to go through this uh, analysis. There are a few differences. Uh, the differences relate to uh, notice. So for example, um, under the local ordinance, um, all hotels would be required to give notice to uh, all their employees, th those that were laid off or not, uh, that the ordinance had passed and what it provides. There is no similar provision under state law. When the employee gets notice of the right uh, for possible recall, um, under state law, they have five days to decide. Under a local law, they get 10 days to decide, so they get a little bit longer. One other difference is in terms of uh, the definition of a qualified employee. So both of them talk about if you've held the position previously, local ordinances do go a little bit further in that they say that if you could be trained for that new position, uh, you are also qualified. The last difference has to do with um, how it gets enforced. State law says you go to the labor commissioner um, and a local ordinance uh, says that it can be a private right of action so you can file a lawsuit. And the differences there, I think, are, well, if you're going to file a lawsuit, you're probably going to need an attorney um, where you don't need an attorney to file with the labor commissioner. Um, but uh, although both processes can be lengthy, sometimes administrative proceedings can take longer. Um, I did reach out to the Labor Commissioner's Office yesterday and was told that if it's a COVID-related matter, that you do move up on the, on, the, on the wait time. One other thing I feel like I should point out is that the ordinance that was drafted by labor groups uh, provide that for private right of action, it can be 
uh, by that uh, employee or by the city. And after conferring with the city attorney, that is not something that our office would recommend that, that our office would file on behalf of employees. Um, but that's really a policy call, but that's, that's not a direction that we, our office would prefer to go in for a variety of reasons. So I think that that's probably uh, the, a, a brief discussion there of the similarities and differences. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Eddie or uh, Victoria, any questions about that presentation? And, and just to be clear, what we're looking to find out is because the state law passed, um, do we still, is it still of interest of this uh, committee to um, find time to schedule it on, at the council or are we okay with the state law? So that's the end goal what I'm hoping to get. Yeah, good point. Uh, I'm personally happy that the state did pass the, 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 the 93. Uh, I guess the ultimate questions are, with the, uh, the the time allotted, whether it be five days or ten days, or how to proceed if an employee has a an issue moving forward, and really how we're going to align ourselves, or with who we're going to align ourselves, whether it be the state or the local. Yeah, good question, Victoria. Um, you know, I'm going to be honest. I I can I would need like a grid to or a, a visual to sort of compare and contrast the differences. Um, so. Mm. But, um, I apologize, but I don't have any clear feedback. I kind of need to, to hear it a little bit more. Okay. Sure. Can I, can I want me to do it one more time? A little sure, slower. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I, could, I could put up my notes up, but I, I don't think you'd be able to read them. And I apologize. Maybe I should have had a PowerPoint. Okay. Um, so so um, again, the similarities, uh, the same definition of hotel, same definition of laid off employee, and they both apply for transfers of ownership. So if you have a new owner, there's no, they, they, they're both the ordin local ordinance and state law would apply. So kind of the, the, the framework and the general intent identical. The differences are with regard to notice. So uh, an employee who finds out that they are rehiring um, under state law must decide whether to return in five days a local ordinance gives them 10 days. So they get twice as much time under a local ordinance, 10 days instead of five days if they wanna come back or not. So that's one big difference. Um, the other is in terms of who is considered qualified. Now, I don't know the types of varieties of jobs and we are talking by the way, for hotel workers, it's, it's all non-management, non-supervisorial. So um, you're qualified for rehire if of course you held that position before or if you could be trained for that position. So that is one difference that makes it uh, under a local ordinance um, perhaps a little bit broader. So the other one is just if you had held the specific position and the, the stronger one is if you um, could possibly be trained for it. Well, the, the state law says the same or similar. Okay. So it doesn't have to be exactly the same, the same or similar. Okay, so this one might be like, let's say I was a janitorial services and now they need someone to do food prep. I probably could be trained to prepare something. Okay, so it's, it's actually a, a good amount broader. And then the last difference is um, who enforces it and how it gets enforced. Under the state law, there's an administrative agency, the labor commissioner, that enforces a variety of laws under the labor code. The remedies are essentially the same, whether you go under state law or a local ordinance. Um, but under a local ordinance, instead of the labor commissioner enforcing it, you have to file a civil action in court. So presumably, mm -hmm. you would have to get an attorney to take your case. Um, and that, that could present some challenges, but legal aid, and I'm sure there's other groups who, who would help. So those are, those are the differences. I hope that was more helpful. That, that's really clear. I apologize um, for not catching it the first time. Um, you know, I, I think that the two ordinances are really similar and I'm be interested here in public comment um, if, if there's a strong push for us to, to do that. Um, the other one is it, is it already signed into law? It is. It's already in effect. It was an urgency ordinance, and it remains in effect until 
2024, the end of 2024. So it's in for a period, long period of time. I, I will mention that the city of Petaluma did pass this ordinance. Um, they'd already had it on their agenda when the state law passed. So it was kind of already teed up for them um, right. and, and they did pass it. So I, I, I think they passed it before the state law passed. Um, yeah, so they were in advance of it. Mm -hmm. And have I, I haven't heard from um, labor advocates or businesses, frankly, on this topic since we last met. So I feel hard pressed to do any, to make any changes when we are having trouble uh, managing our current workload, but um, I'm curious to know if my other, if my colleagues or if staff has heard anything one way or another. Oh, I can't say that I have. I'll jump in uh, anecdotally um, on the on the days between five and ten. I mean, it's, what I'm hearing is it's so, and I'm going to love to have Raisa um, speak to this when, when what she's been hearing that it's it's so hard right now to get employees at all that probably. <laughs> It would uh, that the employers would um, uh, probably be calling even you know before the five. So um, what which which you know th that's the major difference. The other one is actually easier to go with the state law. It sounds like as far as that administrative hearing. Um, so I'm curious, Ray. So what are you hearing about the general uh, an overview of the status of workers in that field? Yeah, so um, I uh, only have, was able to make a few calls since the last um, time I was going to ramp it up if we um, did have to go to council with this one. But um, so um, with the two or three um, hoteliers that I did talk to, um, you know, they can't find enough people. Um, so one um, uh, hotel actually, um, not in Santa Rosa, but um, I just happened to be talking to them. I think I mentioned this last time, they actually raised their rates, <laughs> um, their uh, wages um, quite a bit because they were worried as other hotels got up to, you know, started rehiring that they were going to lose them. So the competition is fierce for, um, for uh, workers in the hotel industry. Um, and that's what I've been hearing fairly consistent, uh, consistently, um, even before this, uh, this question came up, that we cannot find enough uh, people uh, to work. Um, so the rehiring, as I'm understanding it, based on who I talked to thus far, is not going to be an issue. They'll grab who they can. And they poach frequently is what I'm hearing as well. I, I am seeing that as well uh, through my businesses, uh, the check cashing specifically. Uh, we're definitely seeing a lot of the, the conversation of, of the pay has increased. And I've seen that in the, in the checks. My only concern is, is a 61-year-old uh, person who, who who commented during public speaking, you know, as they are up in age, uh, assuring that they have that right to return to work. I think that person was, if I recall, she was actually still employed. I think she was using it as an example of age, though she had not herself lost her job, um, as she, uh, as I recall her statement. And, and Jeff, please correct me. The, the local ordinance was asking for hotels. The state one actually goes a little bit broader in respect to, I believe it's airport. Uh, services as well as building services to office retail and other commercial buildings. So it's a bit broader, which I do like. That, that's correct. And um, it's a good point. And I, and I didn't mention it only because I, I didn't really think we had any of those types of employers in Santa Rosa, but, but that is a good point. And I, and I don't know for sure, but, but you, you identified the, the correct other uh, groups that the state law does apply to. The one that we might qualify under would be the event centers. Uh, such as Burbank or, or something of that nature, maybe. Yeah. Well, go ahead. So, you know, again, I'm interested to hear from um, the public, but what I've heard from staff and from my colleagues so far uh, and from the ordinance itself from, from Mr. Burke puts me at ease in terms of the original concerns that have been brought to my attention. And um, that, that there is a mechanism in place to protect people. And in this tight labor market, I think that that gives people a fairly good opportunity without being too cumbersome for business as, as the state is, is suggested. Yeah, good point, Victoria. And, and, I, and I agree, it looks like the, the state has, has pretty well um, addressed 
the major issues. And there's one more, which is kind of is lost sometimes, and that is consistency and predictability amongst jurisdictions. And uh, if we were to and, and to alleviate confusion, and if we just adhere to the state law, there that it does tend to. If we don't have two different places to go to, to look at the the rules and regs, um, that can be beneficial to, to workers as well. So that, that's one more reason. But let's let's go to the to the public. I've got some um, Zoom legalese I need to read before we before we move into into public comment. I should have read this a little bit earlier. Um, John, before you so do that, sure. The, go ahead, Eddie. What well, the people might be interested in in the public comment. I'm really interested to hear how they feel uh, about the difference between the five and the 10 day notice. Good point. We'll hope that th those that are um, looking to address us will uh, weigh in on that. So um, due to the provisions of the governor's COVID related executive orders, which suspended certain requirements of the Brown Act, the Economic Development Subcommittee is conducting today's meeting in a virtual setting. Members of the public may view the and listen to the, the meeting as noted on the city's website, as well as on today's agenda. Members of the public wishing to speak during agenda items or public comment will be able to do so by using the raise hand feature or pressing star nine on their phone. When called upon, they will then be given the opportunity, the ability to address the committee. Um, so let's, start with that right now. Um, Eileen, do we have anyone looking to address us on this on this item? We do not have any raised hands as of this time. And any other communications with questions? No, we uh, do not have any voicemails, nor do we have any emails. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's see, I'm gonna make sure. Um, since we don't have any, um, I, I'll, I will make sure that this lasts. Well, I'll do it now. Um, if you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please use the raise hand feature. If you are calling in via telephone, please press star nine to raise your hand. Each speaker has three minutes. A countdown timer will appear for your convenience. Please make sure to unmute yourself when you are invited to do so. Um, your, well, hold on a second. Your microphone will be muted at the end of three minutes. Okay, I think I got it out. And we may have some public comment during our last item. So if we don't have any other comment, um, we'll, let's just hope that the state law in this, in this regard uh, covers what we need covered and um, that we can support uh, their, the language in their, um, uh, support their language uh, on this item. So we'll move on um, to our so last we, item. Oh, go let ahead. Me just make sure Raisa. that I have it clear. So we, um, we are now not gonna be forwarding it to council. So I just wanna make sure that that is clear. Okay, Correct. thank you. So no much. action is necessary. We're good Perfect. with that, Eddie and Victoria. Through the chair, um, and maybe this is a, a question for Jeff. I just wanna know, since we did take formal action, if we need to do anything to undo that action I, don't know. Uh, I think it was i don't know that there was really any formal action i think council member sawyer mentioned it at a at a full council meeting so i suppose that you could mention it again uh, well, i trust well, that council member sawyer will will keep everyone informed thank you so much yeah it would be a, it will be a good idea to let them know that we are that we have embraced um the state law and yeah, they've decided not to in many enhancements that we're comfortable with that. So I, I will make that very clear. And I appreciate that. That's, that's a good idea, Victoria. Okay, so um, item number four, project labor agreement discussions. And there's, I made a few notes on this and I, I want to um, kind of go over them and, and get the, the uh, comments from, our, uh, from, from, from the members of the, of the committee. Um, we originally wanted this time to go to the to the uh, to be a sole topic today, and because of issues that came up, we weren't able to do that uh, today. Um, uh, but uh, as given how much we have going on and the time-sensitive items that are already on our docket, um, 
So it wasn't possible to make this a standalone, although we seem to, we're, we're moving quickly through the agenda and that's a good thing. Um, I also, I, I needed to point out that um, while this came up during council goal setting um, and I you know, had this checked on, this, this in itself was not identified as a top priority um, or even given sensitive issue. And I think there are a number of reasons why that happened. Uh, the, we just, a lot of it is just, we have a lot on our plate. Um, th then that's not to say that I don't think that this is important. And it's not to say that, this, that the committee does not believe that this is an important issue, um, but it has delayed the conversation somewhat um, is are the, the, the various items and all of the items that we have um, on our plate. But I just wanted to um, you know, make sure you, you understood that, that the, the expectations time-wise, because you know, there is a, there's a, there is a lot going on. Um, so we have a, we do have a fair amount. I'm not, I don't have a clock in front of me. We do have a fair amount of time uh, left for, for this issue. Um, and uh, let's see if this is not, this is really not a, it's not a COVID item. And that's part of, you know, some of the things have been pushed back due to um, COVID recovery and that this, this is not one of those items. Um, let's see, we don't, we don't have a finalized, we, it's not inside of our finalized council goals or the priorities list from our goal setting um, discussion when this came up, um, but we also had a lot going on as we still do. Uh, so we will need to be, uh, be really aware of staff resources and uh, they're, that's something that we're always aware of now because there is so much going on. So that's something to be considered um, is capacity with, with our staff um, and, expect and expectations of the community and other groups around this particular issue. Um, and let's see, what else did I mention? Um, Let's see, we're not gonna, we may, we may run out of time today. It's kind of hard to say, I mean, depending on, on what our decision is as far as moving this to the council or not uh, in the near future or, or they, you know, in, in, the, in the months to come, um, we, um, we may run out of time today because we do need to come up with a, with a, with a recommendation, um, I think uh, one way or the other. Um, but it looks like we may be talking about July uh, if we decide to bring this back to council. Um, then we have general plan visioning sessions scheduled in June. Um, big you know, general plan, as you know, you know, big stuff. So and, and very time consuming. Um, and we also have the permanent parklet program uh, review before that goes to council at the end of June. So there's 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 a lot going on. So. Um, I'm not sure exactly how we how how to how to start this off. I mean, we could you know, just get a um, um, Jeff. Would would you be able to th thumbnail sketch PLAs for those that that are listening that may not understand the the basic um, tenets of a of a, a PLA? I, I can actually do that for you, and then Jeff. Okay, thanks, Rasa. Because um, otherwise, I didn't want to surprise Jeff with, hey, crash course. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Never like to surprise. Yeah, I think um, the thing is, is uh, for the economic development subcommittee, it's not going to full council, but for the economic development subcommittee, um, we would, if, if we run out of time, we'd only be able to bring it back here in July um, because we have some other things that we have to bring up at the June 8th meeting. But um, okay, in the meantime, though, so what a project uh, labor agreement or PLA is, it's um, basically, it's a, a pre-hire uh, collective bargaining agreement um, with one or more la labor organizations, and it establishes the um, terms and conditions of employment for a specific um, construction project. Uh, and then it's through construction union bargaining projects, sorry, I have to look for my notes here because I had to look this up as well. Um, but through construction uh, union bargaining uh, rights, it sets the wage rates and benefits of all employees working on a particular project to where all contractors and subcontractors um, have to agree to the provisions of the agreement. Um, it supersedes um, any existing collective bargaining agreements, I believe. Um, and then, um, uh, oh, I think another another important thing to note is that um, there, I, as I understand it, I'm not super versed on this, 
They're, they run the gamut, so it can be used for both uh, public and or private projects. So I think um, the local ordinance, um, if, if we chose to do so, could decide um, what kind of projects it would apply to. Um, and I believe these specific provisions can be tailored to meet um, the needs of a particular project, um, but they generally include the prevention of work um, stoppages for the length of the project, and typically, and I think importantly, require that employees hired for the project are actually referred through union hiring uh, halls. So um, that includes even non-union workers. So non-union workers would pay union dues for the length of the project. Um, and then um, the, the contractors and subcontractors would have to um, follow union rules on pension, uh, work conditions, and um, uh, dispute resolutions. Um, I, I am not super sure how many PLAs are in place in Santa Rosa. I do know that the Santa Rosa Junior College has a PLA in place for their um, science and technology building. Um, and I looked that up. It's about um, 78 or $80 million uh, project. Um, and then they also have one for the renovation of their auditorium. And I think that was around 30 um, or like $32 million. Um, the other thing on my notes, let's see, um, you know, something that I know specific to having done the uh, minimum wage ordinance, um, depending on which side of the aisle you stand on, like how you view PLAs, uh, you know, there's, you can find studies in support or against it. So I just want to be clear that <laughs> there's a wealth of information on both sides of the issue here. Um, but what I'm hoping that we can have is um, not bring up outlier examples, but we can look apples to apples when we're looking at um, PLA projects or non-PLA projects or union or non-union projects. Um, because we, um, I've noticed that um, it, it's hard to have a good conversation on this issue um, when we're looking at things that are not necessarily relevant to what, um, what our market is here, the kinds of projects that we have here, et cetera. Um, the other thing that I noted is that, um, uh, that well, you know, this is a, a, a something that's uh, promoted by unions um, and, um, and supports the hiring through union halls, even of non-union workers. Um, and even though those non-union workers have to pay union dues, um, I do want to point out there's a, the opposite side from what I was just saying, which is here locally in particular, I think the majority, something like 85% of our, of the construction industry um, locally is, or regionally, I should say, is non-union. Um, so, um, you know, it, it might affect also um, how our local uh, construction industry um, uh, responds or reacts to this. So that's the last thing I want to point out. And then, Jeff, I don't know if you're familiar with PLAs, if you have anything to add on that, but hopefully that's enough to get us started in the conversation. So I just heard about this yesterday. And so I just did a little bit of research and I, I think that's really actually a very good summary. And uh, I don't know what kind of public comment you'll get or how much background you already have, but yeah, I mean, I, I think Rice has kind of identified the pros and cons that are out there and, um, I think I'll leave it at that. Okay. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks for that that thumbnail sketch, Rice. I know there's a, there's there's a lot of discussion around this particular issue. Could you um, clarify one thing for me? You mentioned the making sure that we deal with apples and apples and not apples and oranges. Could you give me a sense of one of those examples that might be apples and oranges? Yeah, I mean, I don't know enough about it. I just know from my experience in dealing with these, sometimes we get these sort of like crazy, like in this project that happened in X, you know, city. Oh. And I was like, ah, you know, it's not something that um, that is necessarily relevant here. Um, the other thing, and I, again, this, I'm basing this off of, um, you know, my experience when I was doing the minimum wage, you know, it was, um, you know, things came up or disagreements with um, with ideas behind minimum wage, for example, um, that were not at all under our um, ability to review, such as um, tip credit. So I can't, I don't know enough mm. about this to be able to say, okay, well, here's um, a really good example. Um, but, you know, uh, 
the only thing I can think of off the top of my head is potentially um, the question of, um, you know, fair wage issues. Um, you know, my understanding of what we, uh, what the wages are here, they're very high. I mean, that's, uh, they're high across the board, whether you're union or non-union. Is there much of a difference? I don't know. So I don't want to say, well, you know, an outlier thing might be, and I, I'm making this up because I really don't know, you know, uh, um, at such and such a place, they pay, you know, so little and union wages are up here. I just don't know enough about what it could be. Um, so I'm, I think it's more of a, a question for um, those in support or those against to sort of, you know, have a realist, let us have a realistic conversation or please inform realistically to our, to our locale what that conversation would be so we can understand it better. Sure, and, and I'm sure that there, there will be lots of, um, you know, if, if we bring this to the full council, um, and I, you know, have a, I, I don't think I have to have too, too large of a crystal ball to think that we're probably going to be bringing this to full council for, for a good airing. Um, but I, um, before we move to public comment, any quick questions? Victoria or Eddie about the, about the PLAs before we move to public comment? Yeah, I just I am aware that in addition to the junior college having a PLA that they used for I got to go in their new auditorium, by the way. Uh, about, oh. oh, it was in March of last year. It was like it was so gorgeous, by the way. Um, so I can't wait for us all to get back in there. Um, but uh, so in addition to the junior college having used the PLA, I do know that the county has a standing PLA. And um, and I please correct me if I'm wrong that it applies to projects over a certain threshold, and I believe that it's only public projects in, in that. Um, but I'm not sure. So and it exempts a couple of, of places. So if we're not if we were to do this, we would have a couple of um, regional or local partners that are doing this. Um, do you happen to know any of the the broad strokes of the? of the county one so that we could at least sort of look at a comparable? Um, I don't, but I can try to Google it super quick. It's, it's okay. I, I, know that it's, I know that it's got like a, a, a floor of $10 million and it exempts the airport and one other really large thing. It was, it was a significant compromise and it happened a few years back. Just, I just wanted to put that out there. I don't have the details of it, but I thought it was helpful for us to know that that this is not you would not be unique to the city of Santa Rosa. Yeah, th there are definitely stipulations or, or floors and ceilings, and you know, the, I, I do remember that conversation. It feels like a long time ago, but you are right. There are um, uh, limits um, in in different uh, in the, in that floor and the ceiling. I just don't remember the numbers either. It was 2014, and uh, it just kicked me out. I think it was like projects over 10. Um, uh, projects over 10 million or more uh, for the county. Okay. Yeah. Well, we may get some of that information from public comment as well. Um, if not now, then later. So if you, uh, uh, Eddie, if you and Victoria and, and uh, Raisa and Jeff are, are ready for public comment, we will move to that part of our agenda. <laughs> Yeah, okay. can I just say one thing though, like we were sure. talking about this, um, because it's not an urgency uh, item or because it's not COVID related, like I just want to be super clear too that I don't think we would be able to move this until ne next year, like to get it onto the council agenda for a study session. So um, I, I would suggest too that we can do follow-ups through this committee, um, but the time and resources is probably um, would come later um, would would take a while anyway. Yeah, I appreciate that, and 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 having people's expectations um, well are, are articulated is is going to be really important because there's nothing worse than having an expectation that does not get realized. So I, I appreciate that very much, and our and the council's reality. Um, so Eileen, do we have any public comment um, on this item? We do. Um, the first uh, caller is Eric Christian. Eric, if you could hold just a moment while I get you queued up. Hi, 
And Eric, if you should be able to speak at this time, and if you could confirm that you are able to see the timer. I can see the timer. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Go thank you. My name is Eric Christ. My name is Eric Christen. I'm the executive director of the Coalition for Fair Employment and Construction. We are a statewide organization that was formed 22 years ago by union and non-union construction firms to oppose project labor agreements and the bigotry and exclusion and waste that they represent. To the councilwoman's previous comment about the uh, community college project, the project that was the engineer's estimate was $23 million and the lowest bid was $28 million. It is now over $32 million. And if you want an example exactly of what project labor agreements do, I couldn't think of a better one. So I thank her for mentioning that disastrous project, also massively behind budget. That's what you get with project labor agreements, broken promises, all in the hopes of a big labor special interest getting a monopoly on all the work. Getting to the county, the county took, because I was involved with the negotiations, almost two years where they sat down with various stakeholders now, union bosses don't like that. They like to hand you a monopoly agreement, just have you sign off on it. But the county staff actually did their work as they've done since by trying to keep as many projects as far away from the TLA as possible because they hate it. If you have an honest discussion with them, they'll tell you that off the record. Um, we took two years. So you rushing this to the city council, it's not even gonna hear it until next year. I would actually advise that you have a study session during one of your meetings where this issue is able to come up because clearly you don't know what they are you don't know the nuances of them. You have talking points handed to you by PLA proponents, many of whom contribute to your campaigns, but you don't necessarily know what they are. So I would advise you to do your job as a subcommittee and actually do your homework on PLAs. That being said, um, it was also mentioned that there are studies on both sides. There aren't. There are more than two dozen peer reviewed studies that show that PLAs increase costs anywhere from 13 to 22%. There are a handful of white papers published and paid for by big labor special interests that talk about how good they work. That's not a comparable analogy. I would like to pose the following questions on behalf of the, as was just indicated by staff, the more than 90% of the local construction workforce that is local. What is the problem that this solution would solve? And when I ask that, I don't ask it in generalities or for generalities. I ask it with regards to specific rationale given to you by proponents, backed up by empirical evidence and data that shows that anything this controversial, banned in 25 states, banned in 11 entities in California, that's what you're looking to take up here. Division, exclusion, controversy in the middle of a pandemic when unemployment in the state is the third highest in the country because we've done so many things wrong answering the pandemic. And now you're looking to bring this division and controversy and unnecessary bureaucracy to the city of Santa Rosa. You need and proponents need to explain exactly why and what the data is that supports that. Furthermore, I would ask again that all sides come in, have a real discussion, hear from all sides and do it at the subcommittee level before punting this up to the city council, if that's something you eventually choose to do. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Eric. Um, Eileen, any other um, comments? Yes, um, the next individual who will be speaking is Nicole Gorin. And Nicole, if you can just confirm that you are able to see the timer. Yes, I can see it. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Uh, Nicole Gehring with Associated Builders and Contractors. We're a construction trade association and an apprenticeship training program uh, all throughout Northern California. We have a number of members in that live and work in Santa Rosa and their workforce. And we also do projects for uh, community programs, second chance uh, rehabilitation, like parole and probation and Salvation Army. And so we're all about putting people to work. And so in regards to project labor agreements, what we have found is where they've been placed in communities that local workforce is not able to work. So the biggest thing would be, is we want all Santa Rosa uh, workers to be able to work, workers and apprentices. They should all be able to live, work and continue to build their community. And we saw recently in the Sonoma Valley Un Unified School District, a PLA that was just passed, that the uh, 
none of those workers uh, can, can even work. And all of the hiring has to come from the union hiring halls. And, you know, in regards to apprenticeship, um, only union apprentices can be used. And so the, those are, you know, taking opportunities and displacing prevailing wage opportunities to earn money from those workers. In the event of the PLA where there are, is a core worker provision as in the Sonoma County, if those workers are able to work uh, on the non-union side, they actually, I just looked it up for a carpenter, a carpenter's pension amount is $10.65. That would be lost to the union. And so that would be on a thousand hour job, they would lose $10,650 of their own money. And that's money that they are usually making on a prevailing wage job. So that, there is a large loss, loss of funds to them uh, unless they join the union and, and then we're able to vest over time. But just for one particular project, you you would lose that funding opportunity. The staff report uh, from, San Juan, from Sonoma County on the uh, behavioral health unit indicated that the PLA was gonna add 10 to 14% for that project. That project had a fixed budget of 48.8 million, which means they would have had to, uh, they have to find an additional 3.8 million or make significant uh, adjustments in value engineering in order to uh, uh, make that project succeed. Uh, we, we've seen that a lot in a lot of cities where there's only been one bid and the bids are higher than estimates and there's had to have been a lot of value engineering. So it is gonna impact the community. So I would suggest that you uh, think of all the Santa Rosa workers, let, let them all work. And the best way to have all workers working is without a PLA because that's where union and non-union workers work together. And I would also recommend you survey your contracting community to find out what their positions on, on this topic. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Nicole. Eileen, back to your court. Uh, yes, uh, Richard Marcosin. Um, you should be, let me just reset the time for you. And if you would please confirm that you are able to see the timer. I see the timer, thank you. Good uh, morning, uh, council members, Richard Markison, and I represent the Western Electrical Contractors Association, the Plumbing, Heating, Cooling Contractors of California, the American Fire Sprinkler Association, and the Independent Roofing Contractors of California. Uh, each of them have an active uh, contractor community, but are also, like ABC, sponsors of state-approved apprenticeship programs. This is the earn and learn model that allows replacements for uh, retiring uh, journey workers. Uh, I think uh, Ms. De La Rosa did an excellent job of describing uh, project labor agreements, but a couple of clarifications. Uh, one is on um, the uh, setting of wages. As I'm sure you are all aware as a, a public agency, uh, you are generally uh, pursuant to the California Labor Code required uh, to mandate that uh, your construction projects uh, pay the prevailing wage, uh, which is usually the wage established by union collective bargaining agreements. So although there are some uh, provisions in the uh, project labor agreement dealing with wages, uh, the wages themselves are set uh, by uh, California uh, code. Also, uh, the uh, PLA does not supersede the other individual collective bargaining agreements that uh, are put in place on all of the sub trades. In fact, the typical project labor agreement will incorporate by reference uh, all of the other collective bargaining agreements. And so the contractor uh, who is required to agree to abide by the project labor agreement also in essence becomes signatory or, or responsible for as many as 14 or 15 different collective bargaining agreements. Uh, one of the recent or, 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 or uh, often cited uh, goals of a project labor agreement uh, is for local hire. Uh, however, I would caution uh, the city uh, that when you look at uh, the local hire uh, provisions in a project labor agreement, uh, there's nothing fixed in them. In other words, there's no mandate of local hire. Uh, they typically will couch it in terms of uh, the unions will make a best effort uh, to employ local workers, but there is uh, no mandate, there are no penalties, and in some cases, there's uh, not even a requirement for uh, any reporting of that. Uh, one of the other frequently cited uh, reasons for a project labor agreement is uh, based upon quality and uh, delivering the, the job uh, on budget. 
However, uh, there are no provisions uh, in the typical PLA uh, that deal anything with quality or budget because those are the responsibility of the employing contractor and the public agency. And so the individual worker um, has no control over quality or price. Uh, like the others, we encourage you to give this some serious thought and we're happy to join you in that discussion. Thank you very much Thank and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Richard. Eileen? Yes, we do have um, some other individuals. The next individual is Ken Kreischer. Um, Ken, I'm going to um, unmute you and reset the timer for you. Um, and if uh, you can want you, to please confirm the sir. I can see the timer. Can you hear me? Yes, um, please proceed. Okay, uh, my name is Ken Kreischer. I am a local resident, local property owner, local commercial property owner. I'm also an employer and a contractor in Santa Rosa. This topic means so much to me. In fact, I'm actually calling in from vacation in Florida with my wife and I'm sitting in Disney World while I speak to you. A little tidbit about that. I left instructions with all family, friends and coworkers that I was absolutely not to be contacted this week. This was to be 100% family, but this came up and I'm breaking my own rule to call in on this. It's that important to me. I'd like to also add that my comments and beliefs in opposition of PLA is not rhetoric. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm a contractor. I'm also a union contractor and my company employees have worked on probably a little more than seven project labor agreements in the past. And I can tell you that they do increase costs. They do require double benefits for non-union employees. They do restrict the number of contractors that bid projects. It's not rhetoric. It's documented experience and I've seen it firsthand. I would encourage the council or the subcommittee, as others have said, if this is gonna be something to look at, look at in the future anymore, to really do your homework, do some studies, do some surveys to the contractors. I've often said in the past when this subject comes up, don't listen to associations, unions, or union members, because there's one thing they all have in common. They don't bid projects. Your contractors bid the project. A union cannot say, oh, it's not going to affect the price. They don't set the price. The contractor bids your projects. That's who you need to be working with. That's who you need to see what the impacts of the PLA are. So I would really encourage you to do surveys with local contractors to see what impacts the PLA would have in your projects. And as part of that, figure out what it is you're trying to accomplish. Are you looking for local hire? Are you looking for health insurance requirements? There's so many things that municipalities want and they overlook the fact that those could be put into the bid specifications even without a PLA. I would also echo what Richard Markison said to the opening comments, that the wages are already set by prevailing wage. A PLA does not set wages. A PLA takes a union contractor with one agreement or two agreements and binds them to 14 agreements. That's another area where your costs go up. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ken. Back to the fun. Take no more calls. I'm gone. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Eileen? Our next speaker is R Rogern. Um, Rogern, I'm going to go ahead and reset the timer for you. Um, if you would please confirm that you are able to see the clock, please. Uh, Rogern, um, you have um, the ability to unmute yourself if you so choose. Yes, were you calling? Ow, 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 ow. Hold on. Come back to me. Okay, we'll come back to you, Rogan. Uh, go ahead to the next caller, Eileen. Okay, the next caller is Sherry Cabral. Sherry, if you would please confirm uh, your ability to see the timer, that would be wonderful. I can see the timer. Can you guys hear me? Yes. 
Perfect. So my name is Cherie Cabral and I represent the North Bay Building and Construction Trades Council. Um, kind of coming into this a little bit late, but I have listened to a number of what the speakers have had to say. And what I should tell you is before I came to the North Bay Building Trades, I worked for and I represented the State Building Trades Council, which covers all of California. And my primary purview and responsibility was project labor agreements. And I have worked on PLAs across the entire state of California, and I've done so for the last 10 to 12 years. Across the state of California, municipal PLAs have increased, the number of them have increased by over 500%. And the reason for that is that because they have become an effective mechanism and tool for a municipality in order to effectuate change and drive economic development on a local basis. You know, it's your own capacity to create local jobs. So using a PLA is the only legal way that that can be done under construction and project management. Um, there's not another mechanism that allows you to govern your workforce, either through an ordinance or otherwise. The PLA is the only tool that actually allows that to happen. And I've, I've had a number of encounters statewide with a number of the speakers that you're hearing today. And the one thing that I will tell you is this, statistically, what they are offering you up is not correct. Statistically, 60% of projects that are bid underneath of a project labor agreement go to non-union contractors. So if a non-union contractor was so unwilling to bid projects, you would not see 60% of contracts that are let under PLAs go to non-union contractors. Two, Local hire works. Santa Rosa JC is a perfect example of that. The Burbank Auditorium had almost 70% local hire, both in, both in framework of the number of hours that were worked and the number of individuals who were employed. So yes, it does work and it is an effective tool. The idea that your cost on a project is tied to the project labor agreement is a fallacy. The cost of labor is controlled by prevailing wage, and that is it. There's nothing else that governs that cost. So the other costs on a construction project are driven solely by economics, material availability, availability of contractors, and it's a, a basic equation that comes down to supply and demand. When times are good, there's fewer contractors to bid and their prices go up. When times are bad, there's more contractors to bid and they're willing to undercut each other. Or you have a situation in the market like you do now where materials costs have gone through the roof and we've all seen that. That has absolutely nothing to do with a PLA. The PLA in and of itself does not increase costs. However, it is your tool to employ a local workforce and to be able to say that those individuals who live here that pay taxes to you can work here. Section Public contract section code 2500 does not allow for discrimination against non-unions. So that is not a part of the conversation despite what other people are telling you. So with that, I respectfully urge you folks to, to have the discussion, to look at PLAs, to put this as one of the tools in the council's toolbox for being able to make change locally and to be able to keep contr local control of that type of change and development. So thank you for your time this morning. Thanks, Sheree. Thank you. Eileen. Uh, the next individual, we're going to go back to Rogern. Um, okay. Let me reset the clock for you. And if you would test your audio for us. Rogern. I'm here. Uh, did you say test the audio bar? Uh, oh, no, I just, uh, we can hear you. That's wonderful. Are you able to see the timer? Uh, yes, I see it fine. Thank you. I'm Roger wonderful. Nelson. Uh, I am president and owner of Midstate Construction, a fairly large local contractor that's been working in this area for a long time. I, I want everybody to understand first that we are perfectly capable of doing PLA projects. And many of our projects have both union and non-union subcontractors on them. We do a lot of prevailing wage affordable housing projects. So we are not, I'm, I'm not coming to you today as a contractor with a vested interest, but as a taxpayer and somebody who believes in fair dealing. Uh, on a, I, I think it's been said, but I think everybody should understand that uh, a PLA 
mandate certain wages, but those wages are already required on uh, anything that is funded by the county, the state, or the city. So for example, a carpenter, whether there's a PLA or not, will be making with pension and uh, his annuity uh, a wage of about $150,000 a year. So we're not addressing a, a low income problem. We're simply uh, blocking out with a PLA projects for a, for a specific union minority. In, in Sonoma County, about 85% of all of the uh, contractors and workers are non-signatory. They earn the same amount on, those, on your jobs whether or not there is a PLA. What the PLA does do is it adds 10 to 20% to your project costs, and it means that there will be non-local people working on your job. There's the local provision means nothing if non-signatory contractors choose not to go after your project. They will end, they will turn it down in favor of better work that doesn't have the constraint of a PLA. So I, I urge you to investigate all aspects of what a PLA will do to your project and look at the fairness. Uh, if you segregate your work so that it's only for a minority of the contractors in the area. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Eileen. Yes, we do have some additional individuals. Um, the next person is Ananda Sweet. Um, Ananda, I'm going to go ahead and reset the timer for you. If you would please confirm that you're able to see it. I can. Wonderful, please proceed. Great. Uh, good morning, council member staff, and on the suite with the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber. I just want to emphasize that we uh, absolutely want and need to be part of any exploration or discussion around a PLA policy. There are very real impacts that come from a policy, and should you choose to explore this, it will be critical to have an honest discussion and a data-driven, evidence-based approach you know, to reach an understanding of those impacts. Um, among those impacts, just one large piece is to understand that a PLA policy represents a choice to spend more taxpayer dollars uh, to complete a project. Uh, and if that's a policy you want to explore, the clear responsibility is to take the time to gain a deep understanding of the full impact and to be able to articulate that to Santa Rosa, uh, you know, in a clear and evidence-based reason to take on the increased project costs, uh, along with other impacts that come with the PLA policy. Um, again, we uh, stand ready to you know, talk through this with you and absolutely we want to be engaged in the process uh, should you choose to explore it. Thank you. Thanks, Ananda. Thank you. Eileen. All right, and so our next caller is Jack Buckhorn. Jack, I have un allowed you to unmute and I'm resetting the timer for you. If you would please confirm that you're able to see it. Yeah, I can see it. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Jack Buckhorn. I'm the executive director of the uh, North Bay uh, Labor Council. Um, I also am a building trades member and have worked on PLAs for many years. Um, I know uh, Council Member Sawyer will remember when we had a project labor agreement study session scheduled when he was mayor. And um, for some reason, it just was taken off the schedule because of uh, really the lobbying efforts of these uh, out of town lobbyists that have showed up today and uh, been telling some pretty good whoppers. Uh, about what PLAs really do. So let's get down to some real numbers. And so we, we talked about no apprentices will be able to go to work. Well, and only union apprentices uh, will be used on these projects. The problem that the non-union have is that they don't train apprentices. And in Sonoma County specifically, 90% of all apprentices are union apprentices and joint programs less than 10% work uh, in parallel programs. And those 10% very rarely graduate. Ken Kreischer was the chair. He might still be the chair of one of these parallel programs that went a period of 10 years without graduating one apprentice. 10 years, think about that. At the Burbank project where uh, Eric Christian stated that it was over budget, what he doesn't tell you is that they came and added new roofs and other 
items that were very high cost after the bid went out had absolutely nothing to do with the PLA. As was already mentioned, uh, that project was done with mostly union contractors and somehow they ended up with 70% of the employees being local and when I mean local, Sonoma County and over 67% of the hours worked were worked by local employees. Uh, we can look at the great casino where we had a PLA, it was a private sector PLA, which had contractors mostly from Las Vegas because it was a casino. And we had upwards of 85% local hire in spite of the fact that most of the contractors came from uh, Las Vegas because of the nature of the work. So in short, PLAs don't raise cost. We have studies that um, apparently the opposition doesn't like because it does show that you don't lose contractors and it doesn't raise price. And this was done at the College of Marin. It's widely available. It was done by UC Berkeley. Uh, it's credible. It was peer reviewed. It's a real study. So thank you for your time. I really hope that we can put this study session together and follow through on the promise that was supposed to be made to the building trades over five, six, seven, eight years ago, however long it was. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, Jack. And just to the edification of the community, um, I've never made a, a, an agenda decision based on a request from lobbyists, just to clear that up. Um, Eileen, anyone left? Yes, uh, the next individual will be Joe Tremaine. Joe, I have unmuted you and I am resetting the timer for you. Um, please let me know if you can see the timer. Yes, good morning, I can see the timer. Um, my name is Joe Tremaine and I um, am with the IBEW Local 551 as a representative. Um, I'd like to speak uh, in terms of the project labor agreement and uh, project labor agreements are extremely important to our local, pro uh, our local projects that we have for both timeliness and the proper installation of these projects. The hiring of a skilled and trained workforce working within a prevailing wage class is beneficial to our community and that these projects are built by our local residents who in turn support our local economy. In addition, utilizing apprentices trained by a state approved training program like our apprenticeship training center, it's a five year program that pays you to learn. And when you complete, there's no college tuition debt, but a six figure plus yearly income with family health care and a retirement pension. <clears throat> when local skilled and trained workers build our local community projects, we get a safe, reliable, properly installed project built by our own community members, which again, they support our local economy. Thank you for the opportunity and have a nice day. Thank you, sir. Eileen. Uh, yes, our next speaker will be Joe Medina. Joe, I have unmuted you. I'm resetting the timer for you. If you would confirm that you are able to see the timer. Yeah, I'm able to see the timer. And uh, just for correction, it's John Medina. Sorry if uh, coming in on my phone here, I'm trying to do multi uh, Zoom. So I wanted to make sure I jumped in here. Um, I'm president of the North Bay Building and Construction Trades Council. I'm also a business agent and was an organizer for Sprinkler Fitters Local 483. Um, so, you know, here I am helping represent the thousands of workers as a few of the calls have been of the people that are actually uh, going to do the project, um, not as in the case of somebody like Midstate who represents the ownership uh, of a contractor or the contractors that have been speaking earlier or the um, <clears throat> Um, purely on their benefits. Uh, we're trying to speak on the benefits of the thousands of workers here. Um, you know, the argument against PLAs is that they'll become more expensive. This is not the case. Their studies, like Jack just mentioned, uh, legitimate, legitimate studies uh, from, you know, Harvard, Cornell, uh, Rhode Island, Utah, Michigan, universities, not, you know, from these podunk colleges or wherever they're getting their information from uh you know the municipalities are required by law to take the cheapest bid for these projects and companies that have to offer the competitive low bid uh, have to sustain high profit margins right but the bidders must decrease efficiency disregard quality 
and minimize worker compensation to do so. The toxic system of competition leads to poorly built buildings that overcharge bids uh, that take longer than expected completion time and then often need repairs post construction. Um, you know, the prevailing wage is an issue. It is the same wage across the board when public work projects are done. Um, but there's loopholes in the system. And as a rep that res represent workers, even the non-union workers that I talk to as an organizer um, and try to find them a better contractor who won't cheat them out of proper wages and benefits, uh, which I've been doing for the last six years, the compliance issues on these jobs, nobody's out there looking. There's no money in it from the local uh, jurisdictions, whether it's a city, state, or county to go after prevailing wage compliance. We do it ourselves as business agents and reps, and we find it time and time again that workers are being cheated one way or another. These PLAs just close all those loopholes that these contractors are afforded and used to, and the ones that we catch them time and time again, and actually make it fair and even across the board for good contractors that actually pay their workers the complete wages and benefits. So. This is one thing I think that the voice of the contractors and the guys that are working right now need to be appreciated and not just the contractors and the big money guys that are worried about their bottom line and their extra profits. Thank you. Thanks, John. Eileen. And um, the next speaker will be, um, I apologize, one moment, please. Um, Natalie, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. I'll reset the timer for you. And if you can confirm that you see the timer. Thank you, I do see the timer. Hello, I'm Natalie Higley with IBW Local 551. And I'm also a member of the North Bay Building Trades Council. I just wanted to add my commentary to those advocating for the benefits of project labor agreements. Uh, studies by UCLA, Cornell, and UC Berkeley have concluded that there is no evidence to back up any claims that PLAs increase construction costs and PLAs have actually been shown to save money by hiring skilled and trained professionals who make less mistakes and have less on the job accidents. There are a lot of misconceptions about PLAs, including that only union workers can participate in the project, which is not true. No one is cut out and no one is required to join a union. PLAs protect all parties from labor disputes, work stoppages, and ensure workers are paid the appropriate wage for their craft. They include their own policing mechanisms to ensure that everyone on the job is in compliance at all times. PLAs are meant to protect both the worker and the employee, ensuring coordination on the job site and a quality product for the community. I think that there's a good number of individuals who have spoken up on this call who have extensive experience working with PLAs, even negotiating them themselves, and they've spoken to you today about their concerns. I really hope that this committee looks on some of those folks as resources for learning more about this issue and how to handle it in the future instead of just listening to special interest groups determined to spread misinformation. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Natalie. Eileen. Uh, yes, we have one additional speaker. One moment. Um, John MC, I'm going to go ahead and um, unmute you. Um, and if you would please confirm that you are able to see the timer. I can see the timer, yes. Wonderful. Please proceed. <clears throat> Hello, council members. My name is John McIntyre, and I'm lucky enough to serve the men and women of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 551, as their business manager. That's the electrical union known as IBW Local 551. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak before uh, you today. Uh, what we believe is the important, uh, important to sustainability of our community. I'd like to speak to you uh, about the importance of opportunity. We need opportunity for our younger folks to see that there's a future for them here in Sonoma County. Too many of the kids today don't believe that they have a sustainable life here. Even the Sonoma County superintendent said 70% of the kids graduating this year and next that's our juniors and seniors. 70% of them don't see a future for themselves here in Sonoma County. They don't see themselves owning a home, raising a family, helping their kids with their homework, having their kids go to schools they went to as kids. They don't see any of that. And how could they? Everything is so expensive. They're getting priced right out of the market even uh, before they have a chance to dip their toes into the market. Project labor agreement with strong state certified apprenticeship programs guaranteed upward mobility, guaranteed wages, benefits, and pensions will show the community that there is a future for them here in Sonoma County. A future that includes them not having to work multiple jobs to make ends meet. 
a future that means only to having to work 40 hours a week to provide for your family, a future that includes health care for you and your family, a future that includes a pension that will allow you to retire with dignity, still having the ability to hold your grandkids and swing a golf club. This is the future that a project labor agreement brings, more opportunity for more community members. How can we take, how can we ask our future workforce to plan to stay here when we don't take advantage of the opportunities staring us right in the face? You know, one of the comments that was made earlier also uh, regarding unions and pensions was not an accurate statement. Yet again, not an accurate statement. If a non-union worker uh, uh, electrical worker is out there on a project labor agreement and they accumulate pensions or health care, they get to also partake in the health care that they've uh, paid into. They get also to take that pension with them when the project is over. So we want to make sure that whenever these statements are being made, they're not absolute and most of the times they're not actual, <clears throat> they're not accurate. So there's always another side and we're hoping that you're hearing the other side. Project labor agreements will only benefit the community because more opportunity for more folks making what we believe is a livable wage here in Sonoma County will mean more folks staying here in Sonoma County. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, John. Eileen, anyone else pop up to speak? Uh, yes, Keith Woods. Um, Keith, I'm going to allow you to unmute yourself and reset the timer for you if you would confirm that you're able to see the timer. Got it. Keith? Great, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Thank you, um, John and uh, council members. Uh, my name is Keith Woods. I'm the CEO of the North Coast Builders Exchange, roughly um, 1,100 members in the North Bay, uh, union and onion union firms alike. Wow, I'm going to try and uh, just do a wrap up of what uh, I want you to walk away with um, um, more than anything else uh, out of what you've heard today. Uh, one, um, I'm going to read you a couple of things. Press Democrat did an editorial years ago when the uh, press, uh, excuse me, the junior college uh, was looking into PLAs. And I'll just give you a couple of things they said because they're sitting out there, objective, looking at it, and uh, trying to figure out what's best for the community. What they said in their editorial is, quote, so here's the primary question we have about PLAs. What problem is being resolved by adopting a policy such as this? There's no evidence of construction delays, cost overruns, unfair labor projects that would warrant such a solution. Uh, they continue to say what's broken that requires this kind of fix, one that has the potential to drive up the cost of publicly funded projects while ev essentially discouraging, if not excluding, uh, lo local non-union employers. That's at the guts, that's at the core of all of this. How many uh, 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 labor, uh, how many strikes have there been? How many problems with the uh, bidding for your 150 years of open and fair competition? What the first question the three of you ought to ask before sending this on to the council is, what are we doing with such a draconian, and it is draconian agreement. What are, why are we doing this in the middle of a pandemic uh, when we're trying to recover, when you've got other things to do, why are you taking this on is a legitimate question. Uh, uh, numerous speakers said, oh, we've got Harvard and Carne uh, uh, Cornell and all these. Yeah, uh, sure, they may have their studies and I don't know who paid for them. And you ought to look at any study out there. But let's remember what happened, not by any outside study group, not by our group. Let's look again, as was mentioned, at what county staff who did their research said about uh, their jail project just several months ago. You heard it before and it's worth repeating. Quote, from staff, reasonable estimates for the cost of adding a project labor agreement to a project of this side range, uh, the cost will be between 10 and 14%, which means that the project labor agreement will yield an additional cost of 3.6 to $3.8 million. Now is the city rolling in dough to the point where 
uh, a major project, adding on 10 to 14, which might even be low, is going to be acceptable? Uh, I don't think so. We did our own study of 200 contractors, union and non-union, and we asked, do PLAs generally increase or decrease costs? 74% of contractors, union and non-union, said it increased costs. That we asked, would PLAs uh, on the project of the JC be a disincentive to bid? 62%. And finally, are PLAs likely to reduce the number of bidders? The answer was 62% said yes. Why are you even considering doing this is question number one. Thank you, Keith. Eileen? Yes, we do have additional callers. Um, one moment. Uh, the next caller is Frank. Frank, I have allowed you to unmute. I'm resetting the timer for you. If you would confirm that you can see it, that would be wonderful. Yeah, I, I can uh, see the timer. Great, thank you. Yeah, hi, my name is Frank Reardon. I'm a business agent for Plumbers Local 38 um, here in Santa Rosa. I have my office sits in a, uh, a school facility. Um, we have about 100 students up here in the North Bay and another 400 in San Francisco. I'm the guy that writes uh, the prevailing wage. It's my signature basically on the, the wage that is used on all prevailing wage jobs. So all the contractors on a, on a prevailing wage job, whether they're union or non-union, use my wage. It's my wage. And we all buy pipe. Speaking from a plumber's point of view, we all buy pipe from the same place. So if there are these accusations of project labor agreements costing more, it's not possible unless somebody's cheating. And the, the contractors have the playbook. They know exactly how to get around the, the requirements that are uh, on any prevailing wage job. What a project labor agreement does is it has built-in policing, namely myself and some of the other labor reps that have spoken today. So it's just simply a way to make sure that the taxpayers get what they're paying for and asking for, which, which is a high level of construction expertise on their, on, their, uh, on their projects that are being paid for with their taxes. So that's, that's my point. Everybody's made some really good points today and I wanted to reemphasize uh, that point of view as well. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Thank you. Eileen. And uh, the next caller will be Chris Snyder. Um, Chris, if you could hold on just one moment. Uh, um, uh, you are able to, oh, I apologize, Chris. Let's try that one more time. Um, you should be able to unmute at this point. I'm resetting the timer. If you would confirm that you are able to see it. I am. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, no, I'm just uh, wanted to drop in and uh, speak strongly in favor of project labor agreements. Um, I, and I, I just heard Spank, Frank speak, and he is absolutely right. I mean, there is the cost of prevailing wage is prevailing wage, and the only way that uh, costs go up is if contractors cheat. Um, and it's it, the wage is what it is, but what this does do is it allows local apprentices to actually get in on the projects in their own communities and work in their communities, as opposed to going down to San Francisco or on, on the East Bay. Um, the labor communities in this area have uh, so many great, uh, uh, we have a trades introduction program. Uh, we have kids that are out, that we take out and look at these projects and we get them directly into a career pathway. And, and when you are in a union career pathway, you have lifetime medical, you have lifetime uh, pension benefits. It's all privately funded. There's no, uh, the, the apprenticeships, the kids don't, they're not coming out with $100,000 in student loan debt. It's all pay as you go. And these are the type of projects that allow these guys to work, to learn. And I mean, it's just, it's a bonus to the community. It's a bonus to the, you know, the kids out there um, building our infrastructure, the future. And I just uh, really strongly, strongly support uh, project labor agreement here in Santa Rosa. I'm a Santa Rosa resident and I, I you know, I, the value, I, I've seen it over and over again in my career, um, watching these kids come out of high school, young adults, you know, some people even, you know, some, some people with problems coming back into the labor unions and these, it transforms their lives. And 
you know, there's not a lot of good middle class jobs left, and these are some of those. And, and anything we can do to continue to support that, I, I fully support us, you know, not only as a union rep, but as a Santa Rosa resident. Um, and so please uh, pass project labor agreement. I'll do everything I can to support it. And I, I, I think it's just it's just a wonderful thing all the way around. Thanks for your time. Uh, John, you're uh, you're muted at the moment. Do we have any other speakers? We do not. Okay, we'll just give it another. Oh, I, oh no, I apologize. We do not have any additional speakers at this time. And do we have any written or recorded comments? Okay. Um, and I, uh, we do not have any written or uh, comments or um, any voicemails for this item either. Okay. Thank you very much. And we're, well, we're getting, getting down to that hour and a half zone. So, um, Eddie uh, and Victoria, uh, comments on, after hearing public comment. Yes. Or, um, or questions. Yeah. Thank you, um, John. So the one thing that I think that everybody agreed on is that we should be thoughtful in how we approach this and gain more information. Even though there was a lot of disagreement about the issue, I think only one person thought that there was no particular reason that we ought to look at this carefully. Um, the one thing that I, I want to respectfully push back on is um, one that, you know, the, that, that, the studies that come out of large research universities are factually incorrect. In this era of um, people feeling like they're entitled to their own facts, I, I think I find that really troubling, um, separate and apart from a discussion of whether or not PLAs are valid. And so I think that we need to, to, be, to honor um, the, the research methods and practices. We may not always agree with outcomes, but, um, it's really concerning to me when we start to erode what we all believe in as this fact. And so to that, to that end, you know, we're all entitled to our own opinions, but not our own facts. And so I do hope that we take this up in an empirical way. And the other thing that uh, really struck me is that uh, there was an underlying tension between cost versus value. And so I heard folks saying that this costs more and, and it may cost more. I'd like to see more information about that. What I wanna see alongside with that is what's the value to the local economy? If we're paying 5% or 10% more, are we getting that back plus more or are we losing that? And so I'll be looking to see how this impacts our local economy and whether or not um, the investment in this type of agreement helps us to generate more business and more economic uh, availability for all of the people in Santa Rosa and the region. So I'm really interested in making sure that accessibility and upward mobility is something that our council and this subcommittee participates in facilitating. And so to that end, I do hope that we can, as time permits, get more information and, and have a robust discussion with um, some mutually agreed upon facts. And uh, I, I, for my part, agree to not undercut facts from reputable sources when I don't agree with them. So thank you very much. Thanks, Victoria. Eddie? Well, first of all, I want to appreciate uh, Councilwoman Fleming's comments in regards to the, to the reports that have come forth. They should be respected. And in regards to why we should require or, or petition for a study session, it's because we are coming out of COVID. And I believe that as we do come out of COVID, there will be building, there will be, uh, our economy will, will start up once again. And what I want to see are the comparison of those apples to apples. And we ask ourselves, how do we do so? And for me, it's the budget, what, what the, the, the forecasted budget is. And in those buildings that have been built, what was the end result? What was the end cost? And if we could actually do a comparable of PLAs compared to those that did not require a PLA. Uh, a question for me is the, the prioritization of local hire uh, compared to the obligation of locally hiring. That for me is an area of great concern. Uh, so, so I do hear that both sides are interested in a study session. I personally do see the point of, of producing a study session or having a study session because we are now exiting COVID. 
Thanks, Eddie. Well, we, you know, we did hear earlier about the time commitments and capacity of staff. And um, as the, as you both mentioned, getting, getting, doing a fairly amount of extensive research into kind of the, the battle of the, of the information, if you will, back and forth, because I, I did hear some similarities from both arguments. And um, so being able to ferret out the, the you know, enough information to allow us to, to make um, a, an informed decision, which is really what we always strive for, is an informed decision. Um, so, um, and not exa knowing exactly how much time that may take, Raisa, you mentioned next year as, as, as far as being able to be able to gather enough um, information together to bring it to, to the full council. Is this something that would also need to uh, be discussed as far as um, staff time and uh, fiscal obligations and also uh, the council coming together in, in creating its priorities for um, potentially re-establishing priorities when it comes to PLAs because it is no, it's a big lift. It is a big lift. Um, it always has been and um, will continue to be. So what, what, what's your, what, are, what are your thoughts as far as expectations? Yeah, I mean, I have to say just today, this was incredibly helpful to hear um, the comments and um, your comments to those comments. Um, so a couple of things is one, I think, um, I would like to continue to vet, sort of narrow in um, what we would take or how we would present something to council, even for a study session through this committee. Um, I did like the idea of having, you know, uh, I mean, I wouldn't want to call it a study session, but a, a continuation of this, of this discussion um, through this group, um, because I think it helps hone in on um, the uh, issues in the data collection. Um, to have a better, uh, more informed study session at the end. Um, so we, I wouldn't be able to do that uh, on next month's agenda, but we can again, you know, begin putting it um, as an agenda item um, as we have um, time and room for, and maybe uh, take it in pieces. Um, a couple of things that I heard, um, I like this idea of understanding council objectives and goals related to it. So, you know, again, it speaks on both sides to of the data and the problems of uh, you know that council is looking to solve and how we might be able to get there, um, and uh, also we I think it's helpful to un understand where we want to go with um, you know is it would it be public only or private um, projects so we can begin ticking off some of the um, elements of it threshold of cost and I think we can do that through a series of um, our economic development subcommittee meetings. Um, and then um, in terms of council priorities, I mean, to be honest with you, I haven't yet seen what the, the outcome of your, um, the two day study, uh, study session or whatever it was, the council goal setting session. I haven't actually seen what the, what the priorities are yet. So I need to circle around back on that. Um, but it's not as if it's not, if it's not a, even a top tier goal, it's not as if we haven't taken second tier goals. Um, as staff has had time, it's just a consideration on where are we with the top tier goals. Um, so I'm not saying it's impossible, but I am saying um, probably for full council, it wouldn't be till a, a little while, but through this subcommittee, I think we can begin honing in on the ideas and be better able to prepare for a full council. Uh, so um, given that, uh, when, how long do you think it might be before we can bring it back for kind of a well perhaps by the time we discuss this again we will have a for, for our, our full understanding of the um, council goals and the priorities well articulated and council always has an opportunity as well of reorient of rescheduling and changing the priorities um, as we as we move move through the year um, so um, do, do you believe so this is we're in may now um, do you believe that you could have a, a sense of what the goals, what I guess it would be, um, you'd like us to, to continue um, chewing on this for a while before we bring it back to council and maybe breaking up some of the, some of the pieces you mentioned we might be able to kind of phase it. When, when do you believe we might be able to get it back on the agenda for further conversation? 
Um, July is my best guess um, because we've got uh, the general plan visioning session in the June subcommittee right. meeting. Um, and then um, we've got to start moving on the child care program. So that's also on the June uh, program. Um, July, um, you know, the uh, infrastructure uh, financing district, the EIFD question is coming up. Um, so that I was going to try to do for July. I mean, we're a little bit of an early pattern because we don't have, we don't know who our new city manager is or whatever, but, um, and this might affect it. But um, I would say at least um, for a piece of it is um, perhaps July and I can try to figure out, um, you know, how to at least break out what the elements might be that we can start ticking off and then put something, um, put, have that discussion, like how are we gonna break it down? And here's the initial discussion in on the July agenda. Okay, and so that maybe what you could do is, um, and you mentioned July before, is to have uh, maybe during um, staff comments, uh, you could give us a little, an update as far as timing, um, because you'll know more in July than you know more than you do now. I mean, you have two staff, you, you are a staff of two. I mean, yeah. there are two people doing what you're doing. And so it's, that's not lost on, in, on anyone um, on this call. And so, um, or the Zoom meeting. So um, why don't we under, under the, so it, we don't need to prioritize the item because I don't wanna give people the impression that we're going to be um, digging in on that day. But in staff comments, you might be able to give us a sense of timing, um, a, a closer sense of timing, and then perhaps um, we can get it back on that agenda for a, a discussion about either um, phasing uh, the, the conversation. Um, we may know more about priorities. Uh, we may know, hopefully we'll know more about um, the, the costs involved in putting together the information necessary to make an informed decision. So let's, let's use July as our goal time to revisit, or if, if nothing else, to get an update um, through staff comments. Um, but again, I, do, I don't want it to, to appear to be an, an agenda item that we are going to be making any decisions about because I don't see that to be the case in July. Um, unless, is that, does that sound good to you, Victoria and Eddie? So is, uh, I think that it's reasonable to get a, um, an update in July. And then my hope would be in July that we have more information. And I think this is what you're saying, but are able to clearly articulate a proposed plan forward for um, how uh, the subcommittee and the council consider the issue. Yes, that's, that, right. that is our hope. Give it a couple of months to get, to get, the, um, get some of the details ironed out as Thank far you. as moving forward. Okay. Good with that, Eddie? Okay, so um, at this point, uh, there are no other things on our, I don't, I don't have an agenda in front of me, actually. Yeah, uh, that was it. <laughs> okay, so that's what I thought. Um, save the, the, the toughest for last. So luckily, we had a lot of time today. That was, I think that was beneficial that we, we had a, a, some, some quality time for this, for this conversation. Um, so at this time, we, um, do I, in this, in this uh, format, uh, Jeff, do I need to take a comment on items not on the agenda or final comments, or are we, uh, can I uh, finish the meeting? I think we've already asked for a non-agenda comment. There wasn't any. I think we can just adjourn. Okay. So at this point, I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you all very much. I appreciate Thanks. the time and energy. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay.